we will continue with going through the Sermon on the Mount. Greatest sermon ever recorded. I can't definitively say that it was the greatest sermon ever preached because maybe he preached one that wasn't in there. I don't know. But recorded, best one. And in a thousand Sundays, I could never do justice to the Sermon on the Mount because never a man spoke like Jesus spoke. And we could spend a thousand Sundays expounding it this way and that way, which is the beauty of the Word of God. It never gets old. But we could do that over and over and over, and it still wouldn't be like hearing Jesus say it. But this week, Lord willing, we'll get through six verses. No promises. But we're going to read them to start off with. Matthew chapter number 6, starting in verse number 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before, before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and that thy Father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the, the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly now here in these verses starting off in chapter number six if you'll remember when we covered chapter number five chapter number five was ye have heard it said of old time jesus was talking about the law and what the scribes and pharisees had turned the law into and he was rebuking them against that for instance, you have heard of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, turn the other cheek. If a man smite thee on one cheek, give him the other. Right? He was teaching, this is what you've been taught, but this is what I say unto you. And the point of chapter number five, starting off with the Beatitudes, is Jesus came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Right? The law kept us under bondage. Jesus came to give us the perfect law of liberty. Right? standing in the liberty where Christ makes free. Amen. Right? Yeah. The law that we have now is not bondage unto us. It's a commandment from God. Be ye holy for I am holy. Nothing is forbidden unto me unless it comes between me and God, sin or iniquity. Mm-hmm. Right? The Apostle Paul, being a Hebrew, said that he could eat whatever food was laid down in front of him. He could you know, sit down with whoever he needed to sit down with for the glory of God. If that person needed to hear the gospel, it wasn't forbidden him to eat an animal that under the law he shouldn't have eaten. Right? He didn't pick out the food. He's sitting down. He's dining with this person. If it's put in front of him, he said he could eat it. Right? The flesh didn't get saved. His spirit did. God said, hey, spirit saved, perfect law of liberty. You can do what you need to do to be a good witness for me, Apostle Paul. But here, in chapter number 6, Jesus isn't talking about necessarily the law anymore. Now he's talking about how people live their lives. Okay? In chapter number 6, he starts off with alms, then he gets into prayer. In these six verses that we read, I find two different things. First, I find a charity, a kindness, with alms, and then with the prayer, I find one of the duties of a Christian. And if you'll remember when we talked about chapter number 5 it's been a week because last week we had the missionary but in chapter number 5 Jesus you'll not find the word Christian in the Sermon on the Mount because the word Christian hadn't been used until Antioch over in the book of Acts but if you read this the book of Matthew is written to the Hebrews the children of God and it's instructing them on how to glorify their father which is in heaven Jesus is just teaching these people how to be Christian before the word Christian had ever been used He's trying to teach them how they can glorify their Father which is in heaven. And now, we Gentiles, unless somebody in here is Jewish and I don't know about it, we Gentiles have received the adoption of sonship. Now we can cry unto him, Abba, Father. Same thing applies. Now he's my Father in heaven. Right? So Jesus is teaching me to glorify my Father which is in heaven. And he's just telling me to be a good Christian. So in these verses, we find Jesus saying, hey, to be a good Christian... 
There are some things regarding charity, and there's some things regard, regarding a duty of a Christian that you need to keep in mind. So with that in mind, let's take a look at verses 1 through verse number 4. It says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men. Well, we need to stop and define that word alms. Alms, if you look it up, definition, strictly the definition is pity or charity. Okay? Well, not those two words aren't used a lot nowadays in the practical sense, and so now we've got to define those two words. Pity, essentially, just means mercy. It means to have compassion. You see the estate that someone is in, and you have compassion for them. You empathize, em, empathize with them, or maybe you've been in that situation before, you sympathize with that person, you feel a compassion for that person and you act on that compassion that's what pity means charity if you've heard 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 13 preached on charity just means the word love yeah. it can mean a love or more specifically a brotherly love Amen. a brotherly love among the children of God or a love that you act on towards someone that doesn't know God Charity simply means love. But here, Jesus is saying, when you do your alms, alms, normally we think of giving money to the poor, but not necessarily. Alms can be more than just financial assistance. Alms can be a spiritual act that you commit towards another person. Maybe they've been low. Maybe they've needed help spiritually. They've been down. They've been stuck in a rut. And alm can be going to that person and trying to strengthen them spiritually. An alm is giving to someone who finds themselves having less than what you have. Whether that's compassion through pity, maybe they do have a financial need, they have a physical need, they have tires on their car that need to be replaced, but they can't afford it, and God touches your heart to give them some money for that. That's an alm. But also spiritually, Sometimes we'll find people who come to the house of God, just like they used to in olden times. They'd sit outside the synagogues asking alms for the poor. Where did Peter and John find the man who uh, was crippled asking him for alms right outside the synagogue? They were just on their way to worship God. And they had compassion on the man. But also, spiritually, if they're down, if they've maybe had a misstep, and we'll get into all this, if they are spiritually finding themselves wanting, God may choose to use you if you have compassion on them to show them charity. To show them a little bit of love. And through that love, restore that person. Build up that person. Strengthen that person. Now Jesus says here, when ye do your alms. Back then, there was no middle class. You go back to the Roman Empire, especially in the day that Jesus lived, there were two classes. The very poor and the very rich. There was no middle class. You had the tax collectors, you had those that took the money, and then you had those that worked and had the money taken from them. Amen. Most of the time, a person made their living by bartering. This is what I have, that's what you have, let's find out a fair trade. And occasionally they would sell some of their profits to somebody that gave them money in return so that they could pay their taxes. So when it says, take heed that you do your alms, it wasn't always necessarily money. Sometimes it was just a little bit of food, maybe a little bit of wheat, maybe a little bit of rye, a little bit of barley. Just something so that that person could make it another day. You had compassion on that person. And sometimes it may not have been that person's fault. Maybe famine came wiped out all their hard work. Maybe somebody else took an action against that person, maybe crippled them. Now that person can't work. wasn't necessarily that person's fault that they were in that state. But when you gave an alm, you didn't ask questions. You were just touched with compassion, so you gave to that person. All right, so now that we got what alms are out of the way, take heed that when you do your alms before men, to be seen of them, Take heed when you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Got a little tongue-tied on that one. 
But here we have a promise of God. It says that when you do your alms, when you do have compassion, when you do have love for another person, not to do them to be seen of men, or else you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. So taking that promise, if you reverse it, if you do your alms in secret, in private, not to be seen of men, God will reward you openly because he sees everything done in secret. So we have that promise from God. But it also means that at that time, and still even to this day, there are those that do alms to be seen of men. Verse number two, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Yes. Right? And the same thing later, with prayer, they do it to be seen of men. Yeah. They have their reward. They don't give to the poor because they have compassion. They don't give to the poor because they love the poor. They give to them so that others think that they're a better person. The scribes and the Pharisees would sound a trumpet before them. They would pray loudly in the synagogue so that others would look at them and say, wow, they're more spiritual than me. They did it as a way to keep the people that looked to them, the people that came to the synagogue under a type of bondage. They would say, well, that person surely knows more about God. They give more to the poor. They pray more than I do. I should listen to that person because I'm not as spiritual as them. And it's easy to think that the preacher is more spiritual than we are. It's easy to think that the deacons or the song leader, the choir leader, people that get their scene, they may not get recognition. It's not like we're putting them on a pedestal. But they're seen. And sometimes it's easy to think, well, that person must be closer to God than I am. Yeah, that's right. Not necessarily true. That's right. Right. Jesus is saying here, it doesn't matter what other men think. Amen. Do your alms in secret, and God will reward thee openly. Yeah. Don't be as the men that sound a trumpet. Why would you sound a trumpet unless you wanted attention? That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's not like you play a trumpet quietly. I've never heard that. Right? It's not as if you sound a trumpet and then just say, oh, never mind. Just testing it. Amen. You wanted the attention. Yeah. They would give, and they had no interest. They had no thought of who they were giving to. They were more concerned with who was seeing them. They had no compassion. They didn't care about the person they were giving to. They did it as a means to justify their own ends. They didn't care about the individual. So then in verse number 3, But when thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Amen. In other words, be very careful. It's, my left hand usually knows what my right hand's doing because they're connected to each other. Yeah. Right? It all goes through the same thing. But what this is saying is, if at all possible, do it in a way to where nobody else can see your left hand cannot see what your right hand is doing. Now, before we get any further, you guys remember in chapter number 5 where it said that we're supposed to do the things that Jesus was talking about so that men would see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. That's why we're supposed to live as Christians. Not so that other men look at us and say, they're a spiritual person. They're supposed to look at us and say, that person... Because of what they do, I know that their God is God. Because they've done good to others, I'll glorify their God in heaven. Amen. Our alms are not so that other people see us. It's that the person that we're giving the alm to will glorify our Father, which is in heaven. I have nothing to gain in the equation if I'm doing the alm the proper way. I'm giving to this person because I have compassion for them, because I'm showing love to them, because I realize I didn't deserve the love that God gave me. Yeah. I'm not deserving of the grace and mercy, the compassion that Jesus gave me. And now I see a person in need. When I give whatever it is that I give to them, I can say, God bless you. He told me to do this for you. That is an action. I get no glory from it. If they ask me any more questions, well, I didn't deserve the love that God gave me. Amen. I'm just showing that kindness towards you. 
showing that love towards you. That opens up the door for more questions, but if it stops there, they have no excuse not to praise God for what just happened to them. Yeah. I'm not doing the action so I get credit or so that God would even reward me. Because if I give so that the person thanks me and the person looks up to me, I have my reward. That's right. That's right. Just as it may not be a crowd of hundreds because I've sounded a trumpet, but if I'm giving to this person so that they think better of me, that would be my reward. I'm doing it so that God the Father gets glory in heaven for the deeds that I do in this body. But then the lighter part of verse number 4, And thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. There's no promise that that reward will openly be given here. Remember, we've already read in chapter number 5 that we are laying up treasures for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. I may be rewarded openly one day when I stand before the throne of God. Or when he shows me in heaven, this is what you did for me. That may be my reward. Right. I may not receive it here openly, but he may choose to reward me openly here. That's up to God. That's not, none of my business. That's according to his timetable because he does all things well. Yeah. So even when I do give alms, if I'm not expecting something from this person, I have to understand that God will remo reward me when he sees fit to reward me. I can't give to a person this week and hope to collect on that next week because God may not work that way. That's right. I'm just supposed to give to this person because I have compassion for them, because I pity their situation, and because I love them. So now that we've covered what the verses say, let's look at some other scripture on what it talks about when it says charity and what charity can do for other people. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, the latter part of that verse says, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Amen. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, they had knowledge and it puffed them up. They thought because they knew much that they were better. Why do you think they had the guy with the trumpet in the first place? Because they thought that they deserved the attention. If I go up to a person that finds himself in a sad situation if I preach at them and just give them knowledge, knowledge, knowledge it's going to puff them up one of two ways, they're going to think well now that I know what to do, I've got all the answers that drives their faith up that's not good, anything that is not a faith is of sin right. or two, it puffs me up well I did what I'm supposed to do I told them everything that the Bible said to do well maybe that's not what God told me to do for that person Knowledge puffeth up. Yeah. Charity edifieth. Love builds another person up. Jesus would be the chief cornerstone of anyone's life, just like he is for the church. But every now and then, someone gets the walls knocked out from underneath of them, and they just need a little help putting the bricks back together. Just stacking things up once again. Their foundation's still sure, but maybe the devil finally was able to sift them as weak, like he desired to. I'm not supposed to judge. I'm just supposed to help. I'm supposed to love. Does not the Bible say, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ? The law of Christ being the first and great commandment when the Pharisees tried, to, they tempted him trying to catch him in a fault. They said, what's the great commandment? He said, love thy, love the, thy God, love thy God with all thine heart, with all thine soul, with all thy spirit, with all thy body. With everything you are, love God. That's the first great commandment. Right. He said the second's like to it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That's, right. that's the liberty, that's the law, the freedom that Christ gave us. No more in bondage. Just love God supremely and love others like yourself. Amen. We do that and we edify people. We build them up. Yeah. We can help construct them. Maybe they've got a gap in their heads that they can't stand up in. They can't make up that edge. Maybe we need to stand in it for them for a little while. Maybe they've been wounded. Maybe they've gotten bitter. It's not that person's fault. Maybe that whatever happened to them happened to them. But me having compassion on them, I'll make up their heads for a while. Amen. Maybe today I stand in it. Maybe tomorrow you stand in it. Yeah. Just long enough for that person to get things right. And when they go back to their garden, everything hasn't been destroyed. 
hasn't been overrun. Charity edifies, builds up. It will improve the situation. Just talking to the person, just giving the person what I think they should do, that knowledge isn't going to help them. But love will build them up. Maybe if I take the same knowledge that I was going to give them, but I do it in a loving manner, it will build them up. Love always improves, but when I do things for my own reasons in the flesh, it's always going to tear them down. If anything, I'm taking advantage of their poor situation so that I look better in the long run. But then, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Verse number 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. The Apostle Paul writes to the church of Corinth, five chapters after the verse that we just read in chapter number 8 of 1 Corinthians. He says, it doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter all the prophetic skills that the Apostle Paul had. It doesn't matter how much he knew, how much he had done, how far he had traveled to help that person. He's saying, even if he gave his body to be burned, if he didn't have charity or love, Amen. if he didn't possess the Christ-like love that he loved us with, all of it profited him nothing. Everything that we do for God should be tempered with love, That's right. charity. Amen. When we go and tell the world, we should tell them with charity with love not because they deserve it but we didn't deserve charity when we were in their estate first off you may find someone in a situation where they need your assistance or else maybe they will die maybe they'll lose their house maybe they won't have a meal today charity can solve that situation but also spiritually speaking it may not just be a brother or a sister that needs our love to make it through today when we go out to the world everything that we should do should be tempered with charity should be coated in love so that when they see us when they hear us when they observe what we're doing for them they may ask why are you doing this for me that's when the door gets open it's not because I don't have anything better to do it's because I love you because God loves you and he told me to do something for you but that's hard to do if you've sounded a trumpet and there's a whole lot of people around. Amen. You're embarrassing the person that you're trying to help instead of edifying them. If there's a crowd watching you and this person knows, they wouldn't have asked for help. Maybe they're too proud to ask for help, but a lot of us have that problem. I certainly do. Maybe they don't want to draw attention to themselves. Maybe they're just a humble person. They're a meek person. But now there's a crowd around you. That person's going to clam up. They're not going to hear what you have to say. Amen. And really, you're just going to get the credit from all the people in the crowd. Nothing in that situation has really changed. What about that? In fact, that person may be resistant the next time that you go to tell them something. Huh. Don't let your left hand know what the right hand's doing. Amen. Sometimes it's better to do in secret the good work that God would have you to do. Yeah. You have to be patient and wait for the right opportunity Amen. which is where discernment from the Holy Ghost comes in That's right. you listen to him you'll never make a wrong step Amen. it's waiting on the opportune timing maybe I've got to wait for everybody else to leave the synagogue so that I can go up and tell that person God loves you I love you and he wanted you to have this yeah. alms may not always be monetary like it was back in those days but when we do them we must be careful to do them in such a way that God gets the glory and the other person doesn't feel like we are belittling them. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Nothing good ever happens when we Amen. tear the other person down, whether we do it intentionally or not. That's right. Amen. Right. In fact, they'll think less of not just us, but anybody else who uses the name Christian Amen. because, well, that person tore me down. They degraded me. They made me feel like I wasn't as good as they were. 
And once we've gotten to that point, we're no better than the Pharisees. Amen. We have to do things the way that God would have us to do them, not just the quickest way or the easiest way Amen. for us. In fact, he said it last night. If it embarrasses us, usually glorifies God. That's right. Right. If we have to swallow a little bit of our pride or a little bit of our agenda or a little bit of our timetable yes. to do what God would have us to do, and chances are God's going to get glory from that situation. And when we do the charity for the other person, we shouldn't look at them as anything less than us. That's right. Because I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. If not for the grace of God, I could be in their situation or worse. Yes. But because I understand that God had charity towards me, mercy and grace and compassion Amen. for me, that's why now I'm in a position to help this person. God saw fit to put me in a situation and put me in a certain vein within my life to where I would run into this person. Yes. He knew that would happen long before it ever did. Amen. He orchestrated everything so that I, if I have charity in my heart, if I do things for the right reason, I can change that person's life. And God can get the glory for it. Amen. That's why it all happened. But if I'm too busy, if I've got too much on my mind, if I don't have the right spirit, if I'm not praying without ceasing, as the banner says in the hallway, yeah. if I'm not listening, then I could do the right thing the wrong way, or I could do it in a way that I caused so much damage that I could never come back and try and witness to that person again. Huh. All of that comes into play when he says, don't let thy left hand know what thy right hand is doing. But then finally, when it comes to charity, when it comes to compassion, we have to remember to have a spirit of meekness. Yes, especially if it's somebody that we know. Especially if it's someone that is a member of the church. Because we have to do it in such a way that we aren't trying to belittle them. We're not trying to tell them we told you so. We're not trying to say, well, we did this better than you. We avoided this landmine. We avoided this snare that the devil had set for us. Because the Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. Yeah, right. We're not supposed to judge. We're just supposed to have pity or compassion. And we're supposed to have charity. Galatians 6, 1 through 3. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Again, there's the requirement. Yes. You've got to be able to do it without your left hand knowing what your right hand's doing. Yeah. You've got to be able to do it without sounding a trumpet before you. You've got to do it in such a way to where you're not going to offend the person. Yeah. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Yeah. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. If in trying to help the other person, I think, well, I know better than this person, because I would never be in this situation. I open the door. I am daring God to let his hand down and let the devil tempt me the same way that that person was tempted. Yes. Maybe they fared better than I would have. Maybe compared to what the decisions I would have made in their shoes, they're looking pretty good. I'm just supposed to have compassion. I'm just supposed to go to them in a spirit of meekness and say, hey, whatever happened, happened. It's in the past. Can't be changed. I just want you to know that God still loves you. The church still loves you. And we want to get this thing made right so that when you come to church, you don't feel like a social pariah. You just feel like a child of God. Amen. A spirit of meekness says, hey, this isn't about me, this isn't about you, this is about the glory of God. Amen. Let's get everything patched back up so that we can just keep going on for the kingdom of God. Yeah. But then second, not just talking about charity, love. The Bible says the world would know that we were his disciples because we had a love one for another. Yes, sir. We're supposed to have love in our life. Well, those verses are just talking about showing that love, that charity, that compassion. But then in verses 5 and 6, we don't have time to get through everything else. We'll hopefully tackle most of that next week. But in verses 5 and 6, it says, And when thou prayest. Now here we have a duty. Nowhere in your Bible do you find that it is optional for Christians to pray. Amen. Nowhere do you find that it is something that you have to sign up for that once you get to a certain level of spirituality, then you have to start praying. Yeah. Prayer was the means 
by which you communicated to God when you got saved. Yes, sir. Whether you realized it or not. Amen. When you asked God to save you, that was prayer. Amen. It was the first prayer that God ever heard in your life. That? Before that, the sin and the iniquity in your heart kept your prayers from getting to God. That's right. But when you prayed, God have mercy upon me, a sinner, that's the first time that he heard your prayer. Amen. Prayer was the means by which you got saved. So if it was there at the beginning, why wouldn't it have to be there every step of the way after? Just like faith, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. If faith had to be involved at the beginning, why do you think that faith would be left out through the rest of the Christian journey? Yeah. If it's the main ingredient at the start, why would God throw it out every day after that? Yeah. Doesn't make much sense. But prayer, when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 6. But when thou prayest, but, when, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Here I find a duty. Christians are meant to pray. Sadly, not every Christian is known as a prayer warrior. It's not the way that God designed it. It's not the way that God intended it to be. But prayer being an obligation of a child of God. Amen. We shouldn't see it that way. All that prayer means, really, when you break it down, prayer is the colloquial term for communicating with God. The Bible, prayer means something different. But the world, when they say praying, they mean communicating with God. Well, the world cannot communicate with God unless the Holy Spirit has moved in because there's only one mediator between God and man, and his name is Christ Jesus. But communication with God, that's our lifeline. We communicate to him by prayer, and he communicates to us through the Holy Ghost. Even when reading the Bible, the word, the word is spiritually discerned. The Holy Ghost shows us what we need to see in the Bible. It's a circle. It goes both ways. Right? We have to talk to him, communicate with him. That's our expressing, that's us casting all our cares upon him because he cares for us. That's us praying for other people. I'll just go ahead and read this verse in 1 Timothy 2.8. I would, therefore, that all men everywhere, lifting up holy hands, I would, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Prayer involves us listening before we go back to God and continue talking. Amen. Here it says, praying with holy hands. The Apostle Paul wished that men everywhere would pray, lifting up holy hands. Yeah. Sometimes we pray, but we don't lift up holy hands. It's still written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Right. Prayer is us communicating back to God, but what good is asking, what good is telling, what good is talking, just communicating, asking God questions. Well, Lord, what does this mean in your word? Lord, what does that mean in your word? None of that gets through if the hands aren't holy. Amen. If we regard iniquity in our heart, yeah. our prayers don't get... So I've heard people say further in the ceiling, but really, the words don't get out of our mouth as far as God's concerned. Doesn't even hear it. Here, those that would pray in the synagogues and standing on the street corners in our text verses, their prayers didn't get to heaven. They got to the ears of other people. Amen. They didn't pray in a prayer closet because they thought that the important thing was other people would hear them so that they would think, oh, how spiritual is that person? Oh, my. Prayer is something that is developed. We have to pray without ceasing so that we get better at it. Pray without ceasing is not something that you know we're supposed to do and just pray constantly all the time. No, it's an attitude of prayer. But we have to continually work at it so that when we need to communicate with God, we know that it's going to get through. Well, then there are people out there saying, well, Brother Jordan, we're in the flesh. We can't have holy hands. Well, this is true in my flesh. But if I've been saved, I've been robed in his righteousness. Amen. As long as I don't regard iniquity in my heart, when God looks at me, he sees his precious darling son. That's right. I can have 
spiritually holy hands through the Lord Jesus Christ, through my mediator, which takes my prayers and takes them to God. He's been made my high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He can do what I cannot do. He can take the prayer to the throne room of God, give it to the Father. But in order to do that, I've got to have clean hands, can't have iniquity, can't have the sin, can't have the things between me and God. It's not just a duty of Christians to pray, it's a great responsibility to maintain the ability to pray. I can't do that if I haven't been the Christian that I ought to be. If I haven't had the relationship with God that I've needed to have, when it comes time for me to ask something, when it comes time for me to ask something for someone else, when it comes time to petition God to do something for me, even if I want to thank God for the things that he's done for me, I can't do that if I don't have holy hands. Amen. First Timothy chapter number 2, verses 1 through 3, I exert, the, exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Supplications, petitions, things that you want God to do. Prayers, literally the word prayer means worship. Worshiping God in a prayer closet by yourself. Not to be seen of men, but because he is worthy to be worshiped. Intercessions, praying for somebody else, or praying and asking God, Lord, what would you have me do for that person? You're interceding on someone else's behalf, just like Jesus Christ intercedes for us at the right hand of God. Asking God's will for someone else, or asking that God bless someone else, do something for that person. And then giving a thanks. It's pretty simple. Thanking God. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said, I exhort therefore that all those things be made for all men. Not just praying for me. <coughs> Making supplications, intercessions, prayers, and giving of thanks for everybody else. It's not just enough that I pray for me. There are others that I need to pray for. That's right. Amen. Verse number 2 goes on to say, For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Amen. I'm praying for others, not so that... I mean, I should pray for others because I love them. We've already talked about charity and compassion. I should be concerned enough about that person's soul to pray for them. But also I should be praying that God be able to do his handiwork through the Holy Ghost so that we can live a life of peace in all godliness and honesty. That we can do it boldly, we can do it honestly. We don't have to meet in dungeons and in basements like the early church had to do. That we can honestly live the life that God has called us to live. And then verse number three, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. It's God's will. It's good and acceptable. Not just that we pray. We have a responsibility, a duty in prayer to do more than just what God has, you know, burdened me about. Christians have a burden to pray for all men, according to the Apostle Paul yeah. in First Timothy. Right. We've got a burden, whether we choose to pick it up or not, whether we choose to bear that cross or not, and we'll have to give an account for it, because it's in the Bible. Amen. may not be our fault that we weren't taught it, but it's in the Bible. We've got an obligation to pray for all men. That's right. That we may live peaceably. We, not just being me and you. We being Christians, the church of God. God's government on earth. That's right. I should pray that all of our missionaries could live peaceably among men in all godliness and honesty. I should pray for their leaders. I should pray for their situation. I may not know their situation, but God does. Yes. I should be burdened enough about it to ask God to help their situation. Prayer is a lot bigger than most people ever realize That's right. because they never take it as a duty, as a responsibility for them as a soldier of God. Jesus, first two things he talks about, chapter number six. First one, love and compassion. Love and compassion are a very important thing for a Christian because the world does not see a lot of love and compassion. Right. <coughs> well, the second thing he talks about, and he spends a lot of time with, as you'll find out next week, it's more than just two verses. 
but he deals a lot with prayer and communication with God because that's our lifeline to God. God knows what's happening in our life, but it's another thing when we ask God to intervene. You have not because you ask not. The book of James says. And when you ask, you ask amiss. That you may consume it upon your own lust. Prayer and the importance of prayer was very important to Jesus Christ. But what does he go on to say? He says, when you pray, enter into your closet, a private place. Some place that is special between you and God. Some place that you know this is where God has met with me before and I believe that he'll meet with me here again. In fact, when Jesus prayed, what do you find him doing most of the time? He would send the disciples away and he would enter into a mountain. He'd go up somewhere alone and it said that he would pray and that he would fast. He did it alone. Even when he took the inner circle up to the Mount of Transfiguration, he left them a little bit away. If they would have heard him praying, I doubt that if Jesus, God the Son, was praying, you could fall asleep. Yeah. They were a little bit away. Right. They weren't right there next to him. Right. He always had a private place where he prayed to God. Amen. So when he says, enter into your secret place, that inner chamber, your prayer closet, wherever it is for you, it may be a car. Yeah. If you communicate with God while you're on your way to work, that's where God meets you, shows you things. While you're listening and preaching tapes. If you know that's where God meets with you, if you have to at 1230 at night, go sit in your car. If that's your prayer closet, that's your prayer closet. may sound silly, but if you know that's where God can meet with you, and that's where you can shut everything else out, that's the important part. It's not that God can only meet with us in private places. If that were true... Why would we have altars in churches? There are other people around. God can't hear my prayers there. No, it's showing your dedication to getting alone with God. It's some place that you can shut everything else out and you can solely focus on what God wants you to do. Because when we pray, we ought to pray as the Spirit leadeth. It's hard to pray as the Spirit leadeth if we've got so much else commotion going on in our lives that we can't even hear them getting away, getting somewhere private is just as much about preparing ourselves to pray as it is shutting the rest of the world out. Some people could pray in a lot of commotion. They don't get loud. They don't try to overpower everybody else. But it's because they've tuned, they have what's the word, they practiced that prayer muscle to where they can hear the Spirit in a lot of commotion. That didn't come right out of the gate. That's practice. That's developed. That's earned over time. And Jesus went somewhere private. Because prayer time is not about you and everybody else in the room. Prayer time is about you and God. It's you telling him what you want to tell God, what you want God to move on or move on behalf of, or maybe just thanking him for what he's done for you or worshiping him for hearing your prayers last time. But even in worship, worship is not about me and Brother Clint Ruby. Worship's about me and God. Prayer. Giving thanks. I'm not giving thanks so that other people can say, wow, God's really done a lot for that person. I'm giving thanks because I'm thankful that God did something for me. Prayer is just between me and God those hypocrites that it talks about in verses 5 and 6 they thought prayer was about them God and whoever heard it they were doing it out of duty out of ritual it's a true honor and a privilege it is a blessing that we are able to pray to God that I don't have to go through a high priest here on earth that I don't have to confide in another person I can just go straight to God we don't understand how much of a blessing that is most of the time. But it's a true blessing, and most of the time we squander it because we don't take it seriously enough or because some people are hypocrites. It's the same today as it was then. They think if they talk the right way, they have the right voice when they pray. Other people will be impressed, and God will be impressed. God's unimpressed. 
Do you understand that God the Father listens to Jesus, God the Son, pray all day? He's not impressed with what we can come up to. Him. Right? Jesus intercedes on our behalf. The Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that can't even be understood. Because most of the time, God's not impressed with what we say. I may impress some of y'all, but that's not the point of prayer. Prayer is letting down the facade, letting down what I think about myself. It's about humbling myself and petitioning God to move on behalf of me or somebody else or giving him thanks or worshiping him. All of those things privately and God rewards it openly. Right? Thy father which seeth in secret so reward thee openly. If I pray publicly for the purpose of being seen, I have my reward. My prayers aren't really prayers. They're vain words. They're empty words that I'm just saying so that other people think that I'm very important. I'm more spiritual. And when we get into next week on what to do and what not to do when we pray, we find that prayer is a very important thing for a Christian. How can you have a relationship if one half doesn't talk to the other half? And in all honesty, if we don't communicate with him when we come to his word, his word didn't dry up because he's not God anymore. It dried up because we're trying to live off of an unfair relationship. If we don't communicate with him, he can't communicate with us the way that he wants to and the way that he desires to. We cannot be the Christians that God wants us to be if we don't talk to him. That's right. If Brother Brian didn't talk to Sister Veronica for a week, Next week, it's going to be pretty funny how many pot marks he has all over his head. Right? I would find that rather amusing. And I'd be like, hey, why didn't you talk to her all week? Right? She's going to get upset. She's going to think that something's wrong. God knows all. He knows why we aren't. But he can't do for us what he wants to do for us until we are the Christian that we know we ought to be. God doesn't say that you have to get everything right from the get-go. He doesn't say that we have to be the best prayer in the world the first time that we pray to Him. Right. He just says to talk to Him. To be honest, to be transparent, to be open. To get somewhere quiet where we show Him that we're serious about meeting with Him. Amen.